tiny house prepper hi everybody i'm bill and i'm elizabeth with tiny house prepper and i've never done this before <laughs> i am riding with bill today in the um in the semi and we've had people asking us um you know what does it take in a relationship to be able to do okay living together in a really small space? So we thought, well, goodness, what better time to talk about that than we're, when we're both riding together in the semi? You know, our, our topic is how do you live together in a tiny house? But really the question is, how do you live together? It has more to do with marriage relationships than it does with a tiny house because we can live together in this 60, 64 square foot sleeper cab of our truck because we have a good relationship, but someone, a couple who doesn't have a good relationship can't live together in a 10,000 square foot mansion. So it really doesn't have anything to do with the space, it has to do with the relationship. One of the things that has been fun sometimes uh, when we're talking about the two of us riding on the uh, tandem bicycle where we really have to work together. By the way, I've got lovely sun right in my face. Anyway, where we really have to work together is they say that when you're riding a tandem, um, whichever direction your marriage is going, it'll get there faster. So the one thing about being in a really small space is that it's kind of true. Um, it may very well be that whatever direction your relationship is going, it'll, it'll get there faster. But it really boils down to being able to um, have a peaceful relationship with your spouse um, no matter what space you're in. Now, I am really blessed to have a trucking job where I'm home every night. It wasn't always that way. The first year that I was driving, I was driving over the road and I was out two weeks at a time. I was only home every other weekend. So I'd be out for 12 days and then home for two. And Elizabeth went with me for two weeks and she stayed, you know, we stayed together in the sleeper cab of the truck. And for 12 days, we were shoulder to shoulder 24 7. And we did fine. We didn't have any problems. And uh, so, just let me show you what the sleeper cab here is all about. Okay, let me show you my sleeper cab back here. I realize that uh, many of you have probably never really seen the inside of a sleeper cab in a truck. Uh, I have my bed down here and notice that there is another bunk bed up here. <clears throat> and this thing is actually, it's eight feet tall. It's so tall I can't even reach the, the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it has cabinets on both sides. You know, drawer, or drawers and different things. Uh, <clears throat> now, I don't have much set up in here because I don't um, live in it anymore like I used to. I do have a bed and, I mean, my pillow and blanket because <clears throat> occasionally I don't make it home because I run out of, out of hours because I get delayed. The DOT has very specific hours that I'm allowed to drive. I can't go past that. So every once in a while I have to spend the night in the truck because I don't get home maybe once a month. So I don't really have it set up to live in, but when when I did, I had a, you know, a 12 volt um, refrigerator in here and I didn't have a TV, but a lot of guys have a 12 volt TV in here so they can watch TV, have it all set up for home. This is actually very comfortable to live. It's a very comfortable bed. Now this entire thing is the truck is eight feet wide and the entire thing is probably, I haven't measured it, but it's probably about the same eight feet from back here up to the front dashboard. So 64 square feet. And Elizabeth and I lived in here very comfortably for a couple of weeks together, 24-7. And we've actually even been talking about that the last year before I retire, which is not too many years uh, hence, that we might go back over the road for a whole year, that whole last year, and she'll just come with me and we'll live together in this truck and we'll go and see the country. Uh, but that means living together, rubbing elbows in 64 square feet for a year. Could you do that? <laughs> Many couples can't. 
but we can and we feel very comfortable with that. We're, we're bouncing along and the light keeps changing as we turn different directions, so it's a few challenges <laughs> recording this. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of times that people think about marriage is that it's 50-50. If you've got 50-50, you'll be all right. But actually, that's not really true. A good marriage is 100-100. Um, you have to want to be able to love 100% and be able to give a hundred percent um and that's that's the attitude that really helps it to really work i'm going to give you back to bill here you know the 50 50 relationship is it's a compromise on both sides and the idea is if you both compromise you meet in the middle but it really doesn't work that way because what happens if one of you doesn't compromise you know it's the idea of I'll love her if she loves me, or I'll compromise this if she compromises that. But if she doesn't compromise, then the idea is, well, why should I give up this if she's not going to give up that? Why should I, I'm not going to love her this way if she's not going to love me that way. That's why it has to be 100-100. It has to be, I have to give myself fully to her regardless of what she does in return to me. That's the kind of conditional love, or I'm sorry, that's the kind of unconditional love that Jesus had when he died on the cross. You know, he died on the cross knowing that the biggest majority of mankind would not accept him. That uh, he gave his, his life anyway, knowing that people were not going to accept him. That's the unconditional love. We have to have unconditional love for each other. I have to give myself, I have to give my life to Elizabeth, regardless of whether she gives anything back to me or not. And if you both have that, that idea to give 100%, then it works. Now, obviously if only one has that idea and the other one is still on the 50-50 thing, then you're gonna, it's not going to work real well because you're going to have one who's like domineering and the other one. But if you both have, if you're both of the same mind to give 100%, then it works beautifully because it almost turns into a, like a, a contest of who can serve the other one the greatest, you know? And uh, it becomes a really blessed, blessed thing. Okay, folks, so here we are back in our living room. In our comfortable grandparent chairs. Yeah, we were going to uh, record the entire thing in the truck. We thought that would be fun, but we just ran into a lot of technical issues. <laughs> yeah, like bouncing in She's the light. She's bouncing shifting. all over the place because the truck is a lot bouncier than a than a Lexus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's got a Lexus? As if we've had a, have a Lexus. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the truck has really stiff um, and then springs because we of all the loads. And yeah. then we were driving directly into the sun when we were doing half of this, and then it started to get dark, so we just decided we had to finish it at home. You know, Scripture has a number of things to say about uh, marriage relationships, and what, perhaps one of the most well-known uh, Scriptures about this is, is in Ephesians 5. Um, if I start looking in verse 22, in Ephesians 5, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, is also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, in, in terms of the husband's role, I'm going to be handing that over to Bill. But one of the things that I wanted to say before I do that is that, you know, it's um, very obvious that the Bible talks a lot about us um, showing each other love, that he he wants all of us to love one another and to show each other love. And if you go back to verse 21 in the same chapter, um, it talks about, after talking about giving thanks to God, um, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So there's clear instruction from the Lord that we are to all be willing to submit to one another, all be willing to show respect to one another, um, and all be willing to love one another. Um, but it's interesting, when we go down to verse 33, 
Nevertheless, each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And um, I think that, that because God knows women and he knows men, that the reason that he kind of emphasized submitting to the wife or showing respect, I really like to look at it that way, and a husband showing his wife love, is because God really does know us and that it's very important to a man that he be shown respect. And it's very, very important to a woman that she be shown love. Even though, of course, we all need respect and love. So I think the Lord really knew what he was talking about here. I'm going to turn this over to Bill to do his part, the husband part, starting at verse 25. You know, this whole idea of wives submitting to their husbands, I know, is a very not politically correct idea. But um, <clears throat> that's only one half of what's, uh, what the scripture says. Because um, in verse 24 it says, let the, wives, uh, let the wives be subject to their own husbands and everything. And a lot of men, Christian men, like to lord it over their wives and say, say you, need, you need to respect me, you need to submit to me. But they don't go on and look at the next verse. The next verse, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? How did Christ give himself up for the church? Well, he was a servant to the church. You know, the, uh, the Jews of his day were looking for a Messiah who would come as a conquering king. And they missed when the Messiah came because he came as a lowly servant. And ultimately he came to die, to give his life for us. So what it's saying here, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, that we are to love our wives by being a servant to them, by giving our, of ourselves completely and totally to them, by laying down our lives for our wives. And, you know, in the, the macho man mentality, that's not politically correct either. <laughs> but when you put the two together, that the wife should submit to the husband. And show respect. And show respect. And the husband should completely and utterly lay his life down for her. Then you come up with a beautiful picture of that, what, I, what we were talking about earlier, that 100-100, where we're both completely submissive to each other. Um, and the husband shows lots of love. Of love, yes. yes. And the woman shows lots of respect. respect. <laughs> and love, too. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Um, I was introduced to a book called Every Man's Marriage by Stephen Arterburn and Fred Stoker. And I'll put a link uh, down below for you if you're interested in finding it. It's written for men um, to help men improve their marriage relationship. And they talk a lot about this all, whole concept, and they talk about what they call being a bond servant to your wife. Now, what is a bond servant? Many times uh, people would find themselves um, sold into slavery basically as an um, indentured servant because they owed debts that they couldn't pay or something. And the idea is they would go and they'd be a slave for a certain number of years to work off the debt and then after that was done then they were free. But sometimes somebody would find that the ma their master was such a good master and they basically loved him so much and loved, you know, being in his household. And when their indentured time was done, they would voluntarily stay on and they would become what was known as a bond servant. And scripture says that they would uh, put their ear to the, to the doorpost and they would basically pierce it with an awl and put a ring in there that would identify them as a bond servant. And they would spend the rest of their life serving their master out of love. Um, because the master was a good master to them. Many times they realized they had a better life in the master's household than they did out on the street because they were poor or something. But they voluntarily gave the rest of their life to serving their master. And in the book, Every Man's Marriage, they talk about many things, but one of these things is concept of bond, a bond servant, that I need to be a bond servant to my wife, that I need to spend the rest of my life serving her and doing everything to build her up and to uplift her the bond servant would take care of his master's uh, estate and he would do everything that he could to help his master's business, to help uh, 
raise his master's reputation in the community, I need to do all that for my wife if I'm going to be truly a bond servant to her and give 100% to her. And for men, that's how you make this relationship work. That's how you make it so that you can live together in 64 square feet because I'm always serving her. And she, you know, in that 100-100 thing, she's always serving and loving and respecting me as well. And, of course, absolutely one of the most important things that um, you have to be able to do is communicate. And everybody talks about that all the time as being important in relationships. But I think a lot of it boils down to um, trusting your husband or wife, your partner in your life, that, that they are going to um, show respect to how you feel. And you, we have to be able to tell each other um, what's going on and how we feel about stuff. And, and, you know, if we're not sure about something, ask, always, always ask. And really, to, you know, give yourself a chance to try to, um, to talk about things. If something's just not working in a really small space like this, we need to talk about it. And when we can talk about it, we'll usually be able to work it out and it's not a problem. Um, every now and then we realize that we're at a Mexican standoff. He needs to get into the bathroom, and I'm standing working in the kitchen, and and um, I I didn't realize, and he didn't tell me, or I'm waiting to go somewhere, and he didn't realize, and I didn't tell him. Well, and when you're standing in the kitchen, I can't get through. Oh yes, that's what I mean. There isn't. Yeah. yeah, we have to always be accommodating each other to be able to get by because the space is so small, and so learning to say, "Excuse me, I need to get by," and the other person, "Oops, I'm sorry," you know, um, just working together. Um, you know, I, I've had to really let him know in the small space that he can't leave his shoes sitting right beside his chair because when I'm going in the kitchen I trip over him. And um, just simple little things. And so he moves them. It's not a big deal. But communicate. You know, really, really communicate. Keep a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, but really communicate. And a lot of it also just boils down to courtesy. Just, you know, we shouldn't treat other the world out there with courtesy and and be discourteous at home. I think that we need courtesy and praise and encouragement at home probably more than anywhere else. And just have good manners toward each other um, and to be able to be um, willing to, um, you know, to let the other person get where they need to go or do what they need to do in a courteous way. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, another thing that... Uh they talk about in Every Man's Marriage in the book is uh, something that they call trampling. And this is something that men do all the time to their wives without even realizing. They trample all over their wives. Um, <clears throat> we did marriage counseling for a number of years in our church. And one of the things that I told the men in my group all the time was, your wife is not wrong, she's just different. You know, you're not wrong. You're just different. And <laughs> more different than he is, yeah. <laughs> women women are, are very different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I don't understand where she's coming from. But that doesn't mean she's wrong. That doesn't mean her ideas are stupid. That just means she's different. And I have to recognize that she's different and I need to allow her to be who she is. You know? Instead of just telling her, oh, that's dumb, we're doing it this way because I don't understand your perspective. Well, men and women have different motivations in life. They have different things that bring them joy. Yep. You know, um, <clears throat> women are very nurturing and nesting, you know, and men aren't. Um, men are very driven towards uh, achievement. Not that, women, not that women aren't, but men, I think, feel it feel the responsibility more. Um, anyway, we just we have different things that drive us, different things that motivate us. And as I started reading the book the first time, and then I uh, usually, I, eventually we used it in the, in the uh, counseling, marriage counseling that we did, but <clears throat> I started to realize that I was trampling her in many ways and never even realized it. And there's as one example, uh, <clears throat> I think it was probably not too long after we were married. You got that picture from your, your grandmother? Yeah, I got, I got a, a, it's a print, but I got a framed print from my very beloved grandma. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show you a picture here of what it is, but it, it is... It is Auguste Renoir on the terrace. Renoir on the terrace, yeah. Yes. And the, 
<clears throat> what she got was a print, and it was kind of old because her grandmother had had it hanging in her house for many years, and I didn't like it. Not that I didn't like the picture, but I didn't like the fact that it was a print and it was old and kind of dusty, and to me it looked like something that would be hanging in a hotel room that hadn't been renovated since the 1950s. I mean, honestly, that's what I felt like yeah. it. And she loved it, and I just said, no, I just don't like it. I don't want it. So she just kind of quietly put it away, and, you know, and I thought that was the end of it, but we still had it. But then when I started studying in the book and realizing how much I was trampling her without even realizing it, we talk, started talking about that, and here's what I found out. <clears throat> that picture hung in her grandmother's house the whole time she was growing up. She loved that picture. She was telling me about that she would just stare at it when she was at Grandma's house, and just she just loved it. It was very peaceful to me. And then she, her grandmother gave it to her, and so it was, it was kind of an heirloom. Yeah. It was very sentimental. It breaks me up now. Yeah. Just to think about how much I trampled on something that she loved so much. And that it had so much meaning for her. And I didn't have a clue. I just trampled all over her because she's different. You know, the picture was something she loved and I didn't. So, therefore, what I say is go. It didn't hang on the wall, you know. But after we had the discussion, we dug it out. In fact, we couldn't even find it for quite a while yeah, because it was packed away. And I finally found it and, and we hung it in the foyer of our big house um, before we came into the tiny house. Now we don't have room in the tiny house to hang anything. Right. So we have this little magnet picture of it stuck on the refrigerator, and that's the picture I'm showing you. But the point is, I was trampling all over something that was very important to her. And uh, a little, I think a little bit of her died, you know, when I did that. And I didn't even realize what I was doing. So guys just realize she's not, she's not wrong. She just has different motivations and desires and joys and things that in her life and I think for us to really um, be able to really uh, be in a, a position where we are going to be okay really showing respect um, really showing submission to know that that your husband is going to take your feelings into account and listen and pay attention and you can still be really truly partners um, it makes it makes it I guess the best way to say it it makes it easier and safer to be able to just trust God and and live with that respect and that submission and because um, you're still partners it's it's and you know ultimately somebody has to be able to make a final decision but it should be something that you really can discuss together and take each other's thoughts and feelings definitely into account and um, so that, you know, as, as he's grown in this whole area and as I've grown with a lot of things that just healed in my life, um, I'm feeling more and more all the time like it's okay just to be myself, that I can just, um, you know, express what I really like and express what I don't like. And all of that has been actually really, really healthy. And this has been a growth. You know, we'll be married 39 years this coming summer. And so there's been just a lot of years of growth and things that we've had to go through, but we're just trying to share some of the things that we've learned that have made a difference along the way. So one of the things, too, I, were you done with that, sweetheart? Yep, I was. And I do love my little magnet. We found that at, at, we were down at Epcot Center. We found that little magnet of Renoir's picture, and I have it up on my fridge. Um, and, by the way, um, I know he didn't real. He really didn't realize, and I, I really truly have forgiven him, and I need to express that. I didn't realize how much even bothered me until we really were able to talk about it. Okay, one other thing, um, and that's conflict resolution. And um, I think one of the things that we had to learn early on, and part of this is a man-woman thing, and also just very different personalities. And uh, you know, uh, he can look so stern. And he doesn't mean to. He's actually not really a stern person, but he just has a stern face. And I had to really learn to ask him, how are you really feeling? You know, what's going on? But one thing we had to realize was that um, if we run into a conflict, and when you're younger and going through life and stuff, you run into conflicts. We actually don't 
much at all anymore. It's been ages. It's been decades. Since we've really... Since we've had a real serious... Real serious anything. conflict, yeah. yeah. But we had to really learn that... Um, any, any conflict that we have now is just kind of like a flash in the pan. It's just there and it's, it's gone. It's because we've learned how to deal with it. We've absolutely learned how to deal with it, yeah. And we've learned to stay on the same side of the fence. Right. You know, to really... It's not a tug of war pulling against each other. We're both on the same side, pulling in the same direction. Yeah, and really both of us trying to deal with something in front of us rather than being antagonistic toward each other. Right. But, you know, um, I had to learn that if we got really angry about something, he needed time. He needed time to cool off. He was not going to want to talk about it right then. I was not going to want to talk about it ever. He, yeah, as long as we just got away and just let me cool down, woman, and I'll be fine. And, <laughs> you know, we don't. Why talk about it? I'm, I'm, I'm okay now. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, it's kind. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know. Well, you know, just let's just drop it. You right. Know, we're okay now. I've cooled off. Let's just drop it. But what I didn't. And, well, let me say something real quick. Okay. Don't lose your train of thought. But if you ever want to get a woman upset, um, you know, just tell her, oh, just drop it. Um, for one thing, we women are so wired in our brain um, to connect emotion to just about everything and to connect speech to just about everything. And so sometimes it's not easy for a man to figure out how do I feel about this and to put it into words. But for women... We really want to be able to talk things out. Yeah, what I didn't know, I didn't understand when I was younger, is that if she didn't have the uh, the ability to talk it through to a resolution, it would just fester, and it would get worse. Right. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't have peace that we were that we took care of it. If we never talked about it, then we're going to run into that situation again. Right. And if he didn't understand what I was saying and I didn't understand what he was saying, then we were not really going to resolve it. It was just going to be there ready to flare up again but later. If, but if she would try to talk about it right after it happened, whatever it was, and I was really angry, it didn't work. No, he got, got so, really defensive. Like, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And, right. you know, so... We came up with a compromise after we realized what the conflict was. Yes, um, I the conflict. That. The conflict wasn't the argument. The conflict was how we were dealing with the argument. Yeah. yeah. And once we realized that, we came up with a compromise. And it has worked really well. And that was when we were angry at each other. When we had an argument, she would leave me alone, and I would go off and get rid of the anger. However, I would just let it dissipate, and I would be fine. He'd calm down. I would calm down. Yeah. And she would give me the time to just go and calm down. But then... That's right. Once he was calm... I knew that once I was calm, I was obligated to go back in there and discuss it with her until we worked it through yeah. to a point of res resolution. Till we could figure out what was really yeah. going on. So, read that yes. scripture. Yeah. yeah, this is some really smart, smart wisdom from the Lord that's once again in Ephesians. And this will transform your life if you're running into a lot of problems um, with anger. And that is in Ephesians 4.26. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And it's interesting, verse 27 says, nor give place to the devil. Because, you know, sometimes if you just really let anger go, it becomes its own monster. The enemy will just run with that. But the thing that we really learned... Um, was, you know, I had to give him some space, but then we really, as soon as we had a chance, we had small children, a busy life, but as soon as we had a chance, then we needed to really, really talk about it and really get it worked out and not end our day in anger. Not let the sun go down, not try to, to go to bed and both be furiously angry because by the next morning, life was going to be too busy. Um, you know, I had to take care of the kids. He had to go to work. When, when were we going to get a chance to work it out? So there were times sometimes when it got kind of late but we had to get it worked out until we could deal with it and not let the sun go down until the anger was dealt with. We knew what was going on. And not letting the sun go down the anger was really, really helpful. I can remember a few times where we didn't even start discussing it until 11 o'clock at night, and we were up until 2 or 3 in the morning until I could finally go to sleep, and I had to get up at 6. You know, um, But I just learned that that was the compromise. If she was going to give me time to cool down, then I had to give her time to talk it out. And what I learned in the long run over many years is that allowing her to talk it out and us coming to a resolution stopped the festering, stopped yes. the wounds, yes, healed things over and as time went on 
we got to know each other better. Yeah. I got to know, I knew she was different, but I didn't know how. <laughs> but I got to know how she was different. Yeah. And, I, and that was okay, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, as time went on, we were doing that less and less until, like, like I said earlier, I don't think we've even had a major argument like that in what 15 or 20 years I mean it's, it's been a while anything yeah. that we any little uh, flare-ups that and the disagreements that, that we run into now because we know these techniques um, and because I let her be her I'm concentrating on not trampling on her um, we can talk them out and resolve them very quickly yeah. I don't really need the big time of cooling no. down anymore. And we don't necessarily need a big, big time of figuring the whole thing out. Right. A lot of times it's just a matter of acknowledging, wow, we're tired or we don't feel good. And acknowledging and talking about what's going on and being able to really, really discuss it calmly until we realize, you know, there's only a few things that can happen. The situation will either change or we'll both accept the fact that that situation can't change and so we're going to hang in there together. Or we just figure out, um, you know, what we can do, what we can do about it. It's kind of like the serenity prayer. You know, you accept the things you cannot change and have the courage to change the things that you can and the wisdom to know the difference. But um, it's being on the same side and being in this together and both of us acknowledging that we're going to show each other respect and that um, it's going to be okay to be honest and it's going to be okay to really share how we feel and that we're in this together. You know, and um, I, I tell you, I just, I would love to see everybody end up in really long-term relationships in their life because of everything that develops when you have a lot of time and you can hang in there for a long time. Um, and so I'm really grateful um, for the relationship that we have now after all these many years and that we can be peaceful and, and enjoy each other and have a lot of fun and, and it can work even in, a, in what is sometimes, believe me, a very small area. I mean, you know, in the winter time, we don't want the coats to get too cold out in the sunroom, so it's like all the coats are on the bed, and then they, all the coats come and they sit on the chair, and then they all go back to the bed. And um, so it's just being patient, you know, and um, going in and we're tired, we look at the bed and go, oh, you know, and just working with it, you know. So anyway, we just wanted to share a little bit about uh, what has helped us be able to um, work things out and get along, not only in this really small house or in a very small semi-truck tractor. It's so funny saying that by such a huge truck, but for a living space, it's really pretty small. But these are also things that are important no matter where we'd be living, even if we were back in our big house again. So we just wanted to kind of share these with you guys. And um, I'm really grateful for what we've gained. Yeah. I really am grateful for the peace. And... Um, it is. It has really meant a lot, I think, to both of us. So, well, was that everything we wanted to? I think so. Okay. So, if you want to learn to live together in a tiny house, working on learning how to live together. Yeah. In any house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that'll take care of it. Yeah. Listen, we love you guys, and we will see you soon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have you ever been nervous or even a little intimidated about being passed by the road? You've been passed on the road by a big truck? Well, what I discovered not long after I started driving a big truck is that if you're driving one, it's not so intimidating to be passed by one. Now that wasn't so bad.
it definitely is kind of an adventure going along and riding with Bill. Um, I, I can't think of anything else I was going to say. Man, um, 